All right, everyone. We're going to continue on with concepts in renal physiology, but this time we're going to concentrate on extrinsic mechanisms. These are mechanisms or inputs that come from the outside of the kidney, like hormones or neurons, like the sympathetic nervous system, that regulate uh, electrolyte and fluid transport within the kidney. All right, before we get started, I'd like to review some terms that you've already learned in past lectures, but these terms will be very useful for this lecture as well. Uh, we already know that endocrine hormones affect kidney function. Diuretics are actually hormones that stimulate excretion of water. They promote a very dilute, large volume of urine. Antidiuretics do the opposite. They reduce excretion of water. Usually antidiuretics produce a very concentrated, low volume urine. Steroid hormones, these hormones usually are hydrophobic hormones that can cross the plasma membrane very easily. Their receptors are usually in the nucleus. A lot of times they're transcription factors that promote protein synthesis. So it's a very slow response because it takes a while for proteins to be synthesized and then transported to their location like the plasma membrane. Peptide hormones, on the other hand, are hydrophilic molecules. Uh, they prefer to be in the aqueous solution. They don't cross the plasma membrane very easily. And therefore, these peptide hormones, when they bind to their receptors, Usually they are like G protein coupled receptors that provide, once they bind, promote a very rapid response. Within minutes, there are effects within the cell. All right, we've already learned also about the loop of Henle and how it works to establish that profound osmotic gradient within the inner medullary region. Again, the loop of Henle and collecting duct act as countercurrent multipliers to create osmotic gradients that facilitate transport processes. Uh, these gradients are actually maintained by the vasorecta, which is a countercurrent exchanger. Today, we're actually going to learn about um, vasopressin, a hormone that regulates aquaporin channels within the apical membrane. The osmotic concentration of the final urine depends on the permeability of water these, through these aquaporin channels of the distal tubule and collecting duct, which can be regulated again by vasopressin. Um, if vasopressin is not present in the circulatory system, that would mean that there would be no aquaporin channels they, and water would be impermeable to the distal tubule and the collecting duct which would force water to stay in the nephron and your body would produce a very dilute large volume of urine. Um, however, if vasopressin is present, then essentially the uh, collecting duct becomes permeable to water and allows for reabsorption to wa of water and then a very, the production of a very concentrated urine. So we'll talk more about that in just a second. So the four different hormones, these are the four different extrinsic mechanisms that we're going to learn about today. Vasopressin, which is also known as arginine vasopressin. Again, it's a peptide hormone and its actions are very rapid. It's also known as antidiuretic hormone because it acts as an antidiuretic. So again, vasopressin is number one. Number two is aldosterone. Aldosterone is a steroid hormone that regulates salt reabsorption, specifically sodium and chloride reabsorption. And if vasopressin is present, water will be able to follow that solute movement. Only if aquaporin channels are present though, due to the presence of vasopressin. Uh, the third one is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. We'll talk about that pathway as well. And just so you know, vasopressin, aldosterone, and the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway are all antidiuretics. These antidiuretics promote water reabsorption and allow you to produce a very concentrated urine. The only 
a molecule here that's a diuretic is atrial natriuretic peptide. And it's a diuretic actually because it inhibits all of the other three. Atrial natriuretic peptide inhibits vasopressin, it inhibits aldosterone, and it inhibits renin release. So again, atrial natriuretic peptide is the only diuretic of the four. All right, so let's first start off with vasopressin. Again, vasopressin is also known as AVP, or arginine vasopressin, or ADH, or antidiuretic hormone. All right, so we're going to actually start uh, in the brain and talk about osmoreceptors that detect the osmolarity of the blood uh, and then either produce or inhibit vasopressin release. So let's start off here. You can actually see in uh, this cross section of the brain, this purple region that's highlighting the upper part here is the hypothalamus. And then this actual bulb right here is the posterior pituitary gland where vasopressin is actually released. All right, so again, in this upper portion of the hypothalamus, there are osmoreceptors. These are areas that sense high osmolarity. High osmolarity would mean that a person would be severely dehydrated because they've lost a lot of bodily fluids and their blood has a high osmolarity, okay? So again, these are osmoreceptors that are detecting the high osmolarity. Okay, so this diagram is actually giving you some more information about what's happening in the hypothalamus. Again, these are osmoreceptors that are sensing the high osmolarity. Some of the regions are the OVLT, the organum vacuolosum of the lamina terminalis, the subfornical organ, SFO, and the median preoptic nucleus, MNPO. And again, these are osmoreceptors that usually sense high osmolarity in the blood in the hypothalamus. Once that high osmolarity is detected, again, this is a good example is severe dehydration. Um, usually what happens is a signal is sent to the dorsomedial hypothalamus, which initiates a profound drinking response. This is the thirst center. So in addition to stimulating the production of vasopressin, it also triggers a profound drinking behavior. So I actually wanted to go back to this slide just to give you a little bit more information about what happens after those osmoreceptors detect that high osmolarity within the blood. Vasopressin is actually produced in the hypothalamus and transported along these axons of the, these neurosecretory cells. So vasopressin is actually transported along the axon of these neurosecretory cells uh, into the posterior pituitary at the bottom of this bulb right here. Um, then it is released into the blood from the posterior pituitary where, we'll go to the next slide, where it travels through the circulatory system to the kidney. And the receptors are on these um, epithelial cells that line the distal tubule and the collecting ducts. All right, so the vasopressin receptors that we're gonna be concentrating on today are the ones at the bottom, the arginine vasopressin receptor 2, or AVPR2. Uh, these receptors are actually expressed on the basal lateral membrane of epithelial cells that line the distal tubule and the collecting duct of the nephron. Uh, we're going to learn that they're GS coupled receptors. And uh, if they are not, if there's some kind of uh, congenital mutation of these receptors, it can cause a condition called nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And we'll learn more about this on Monday, but nephrogenic, again, is referring to the nephron, the kidney, 
And the reason why it's diabetes insipidus is because it actually uh, doesn't allow for you to concentrate urine. So you're constantly losing water to your environment, which increases a lot of solutes in your blood, including glucose. So this is different from diabetes mellitus. This condition is called nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Now, there are other arginine vasopressin receptors within your body. Uh, arginine vasopressin receptor 1A and 1B. These are GQ-coupled receptors and are located on smooth muscle cells that surround different parts of the vasculature. So when they are triggered, when vasopressin binds to receptor 1A and 1B, it actually causes a profound vasoconstriction, hence the name vasopressin. And ultimately what it does is it increases total peripheral resistance and mean arterial pressure. All right, so let's take a closer look at these arginine vasopressin receptor 2 that are expressed on the basal lateral membrane of the collecting duct cells. When vasopressin binds to its receptors, uh, it is GS coupled. These receptors are coupled to GS proteins. And again, there's a conformational change. The GS alpha subunit migrates over to adenylate cyclase, promoting the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP within the cell. Cyclic AMP levels rise, that stimulates pKa, there's protein phosphorylation, and what happens ultimately is there is promotion of these vesicles and insertion of these vesicles into the apical membrane. So it increases the number of aquaporin-2 channels inserted into the apical membrane. This allows for a complete pathway of water now through the transcellular pathway of the epithelial cells. Aquaporin 3 and 4 are already, they're always inserted into the basal lateral membrane, but vasopressin regulates the insertion of aquaporin 2 channels into the apical membrane. Again, promoting water reabsorption and allowing you to concentrate urine. All right, so just to review, this is a review slide. Uh, summing up the arginine vasopressin pathway. Arginine vasopressin is a peptide hormone, also an antidiuretic hormone, produced in the hypothalamus and released by the posterior pituitary gland. Ultimately, it increases water reabsorption in the collecting duct by increasing the number of aquaporin channels. Its release depends on these osmoreceptors uh, if there is increasing plasma osmolarity, it's detected by these osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, which promotes a profound thirst behavior and the release of vasopressin from the posterior pituitary. Now, this whole cascade of events is inhibited by um, atrial natriuretic peptide. I mentioned that uh, earlier on in this lecture and atrial natriuretic peptide actually inhibits vasopressin. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. This is also another summary slide. It's just showing you what happens in the presence and absence of arginine vasopressin. You can actually see in blue here, if arginine vasopressin is present, you can see plus AVP, then Aquaporin-2 channels are inserted into the apical membrane, allowing for water to be reabsorbed in the collecting duct. So you can see water is, the fluid within the nephron is constantly encountering a more hyperosmotic environment, increasing that driving force and pulling water out all along the collecting duct. What that does is it promotes the production of a very concentrated urine, about 1,200 milliosmoles, almost the same as uh, the osmolarity within the inner medullary region. So it produces very little urine, uh, a small volume of urine that's highly concentrated, 1,200 milliosmoles.
Now, if vasopressin is inhibited, that's in the red on the right-hand side, you can see the minus AVP. If vasopressin is inhibited, then those aquaporin-2 channels are not inserted into the apical membrane, and that doesn't allow for water to be reabsorbed. So water actually stays inside the collecting duct, and the end result is a very dilute, uh, large volume of urine. It's dilute, and probably the osmolarity is about 65 milliosmoles, so that's a very dilute, clear urine. Uh, in this case, you can lose a lot of water to your environment. Uh, again, I mentioned in class today uh, that alcohol inhibits uh, vasopressin, and in that case, you have no capability of concentrating urine and is one of the reasons why you're very dehydrated the next day um, have a headache and dehydrated because, again, you weren't able to concentrate urine and you lost a lot of water to your environment. All right, another additional note is that arginine vasopressin also regulates urea reabsorption. So this is the same idea here. On the left-hand side in blue, you see plus arginine vasopressin. And again, if arginine vasopressin is present and circulating throughout your body, it will promote the reabsorption of urea all along the collecting duct. And this helps with any, if water's actually being reabsorbed also in the presence of arginine vasopressin, it can dilute that intermedullary region and disrupt that osmotic gradient that's uh, established by the loop of Henle. So urea is an important osmolate to help maintain that profound osmotic gradient, even with uh, a lot of water being reabsorbed in the presence of arginine vasopressin. However, if AVP or arginine vasopressin is absent, then you can see here in red, if negative AVP in red, then urea will actually not be able to be reabsorbed and will stay in the nephron and be excreted. So you'll lose a lot of urea to your environment. All right, let's go to the next extrinsic mechanism and talk about aldosterone. Aldosterone is a steroid hormone that's produced by the adrenal gland. The outer portion of the adrenal gland is called the adrenal cortex. So specifically, aldosterone is produced by the outer region called the adrenal cortex region. It actually targets cells in the distal tubule and collecting duct, just like vasopressin. But aldosterone stimulates specifically sodium and chloride reabsorption. And if vasopressin is present, it also stimulates water reabsorption. Uh, in addition to all of this reabsorption, it also enhances potassium secretion and excretion. So we'll talk about the specifics in the next slide. It's interesting that aldosterone is actually released in response to increases in circulating potassium. So let's take a closer look at aldosterone. What aldosterone does, being a steroid hormone, is it actually is a hydrophobic molecule that can easily move across the plasma membrane and enter directly into the nucleus, where it acts as a transcription factor and promotes protein synthesis. Again, this is a very slow response, but what it does, that protein synthesis, is actually uh, a sodium channel called ENAC. Now, we talked about this earlier in the week, uh, ENAC channels are epithelial sodium channels, or ENAC. So aldosterone promotes the synthesis and insertion of more and more ENAC channels in the apical membrane of these epithelial cells of the cortical collecting duct. And what that does is it promotes the transport of sodium across the apical membrane from the tubular lumen into the cell. And then as sodium moves into the cell, it increases the turnover rate of the pump. 
Sodium is transported out of the cell across the basal lateral membrane, but it also promotes the transport of potassium into the cell across the basal lateral membrane and promotes potassium secretion. So potassium is actually delivered into the tubular lumen. Um, usually the net movement is sodium out of the cell, which sets up a voltage gradient for the movement of chloride to follow the sodium across the paracellular pathway. So the take home message here is when aldosterone is present, sodium and chloride will be reabsorbed but potassium will be secreted. Now, if vasopressin is present, then water will follow the sodium and chloride and also be reabsorbed. So you'll be able to concentrate urine. Again, aldosterone is promoting sodium and chloride reabsorption and water reabsorption, but potassium is being secreted. This is also a review of some of the terms that we learned way back in exam one when we talked about epithelial cells, transcellular and paracellular pathway. So when aldosterone is present, again, sodium and chloride will be reabsorbed, but sodium will be moving along the transcellular pathway and chloride will follow the sodium movement across the paracellular pathway. If vasopressin is on board, water will follow the solute movement. So take home message one more time. Sodium and chloride will be reabsorbed. If vasopressin is also present, water will be reabsorbed. But potassium will be secreted and delivered into the lumen and uh, secreted and excreted, eliminated from the body. All right, and one more time here, you can actually see with sodium and chloride reabsorption, uh, if vasopressin is on board and water is allowed to follow through the transcellular pathway, water will also be reabsorbed. So the bulk flow is going to be from the inside of the nephron to the circulatory system, the paratubular capillaries. And then don't forget that potassium is being secreted and then excreted at the same time. This diagram actually shows you how potassium is handled in the nephron. Uh, this upper portion right here is supposed to symbolize Bowman space. And then it's simplified, so the proximal tubule, the distal tubule, and the collecting duct are just one big cylinder. Uh, you can see here that potassium is filtered at the glomerulus. Uh, what's not filtered actually goes on to the efferent arterioles. But let's go back to the nephron here in yellow. It looks like a, a yellow Y. Once potassium is filtered into the glomerulus, a lot of it is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule and loop of Henle. But again, potassium is secreted in the collecting duct and then excreted in the urine. So this is a, a good diagram that tells you how the kidney handles potassium within uh, the nephron. So also I want to mention it is interesting that with high elevated po circulating potassium levels that can trigger an aldosterone response. Aldosterone will be promoted to be secreted into the circulatory system where it will travel to the collecting duct, again, promote the insertion of those ENAC channels, which ultimately promotes sodium and chloride and water reabsorption, but again promotes potassium secretion to get rid of that excess elevated potassium levels within the blood. All right, so if the previous slide was a little confusing, Maybe this flowchart will help you um, understand the process a little bit more. So if you actually have eaten a ton of bananas, there you have an increase in potassium uh, intake. Let's just say you ate seven bananas and a whole bag of dried apricots. Uh, 
you've overloaded your system with potassium. This is what's actually going to happen. You're going to get an uh, after an intake of uh, an increase in potassium intake. What that's going to do is increase plasma potassium levels. Uh, that will trigger uh, the adrenal cortex to secrete aldosterone. Aldosterone will be secreted from the adrenal cortex, which then will increase plasma aldosterone levels. Aldosterone will then travel to the cortical collecting duct, where it promotes sodium chloride and water reabsorption, but also promotes potassium secretion, which is the main thing here. Uh, an increase in plasma potassium levels will actually lead to an increase in potassium secretion and then ultimately potassium excretion, which will eliminate potassium from the body. This is important because potassium can cause some uh, really profound deadly responses. It can cause arrhythmias. Here's another flow chart giving you, again, some idea of what how the body actually uh, handles an increase in plasma potassium levels. Uh, we'll learn in just a minute about the renin angiotensin system, but in both cases, if there is a decrease in plasma volume or an increase in plasma potassium levels, this leads to an increase in aldosterone secretion from the adrenal cortex region. Once that occurs, once aldosterone is secreted, you can see that increases plasma aldosterone levels. Aldosterone then travels to the cortical collecting duct, where again it promotes sodium and chloride reabsorption and potassium secretion. So in the end, sodium excretion is decreased and potassium excretion is increased. So let's look at this further. Let's go ahead and take a look at the renin-angiotensin system as well. Before we do that, I want to review the anatomy of the glomerulus and uh, those cells that are very closely associated with the afferent arterioles. Uh, now I'm going to introduce to you these juxtaglomerular cells. These juxtaglomerular cells actually re release that enzyme called renin. And that's the first part of that pathway. Renin is an enzyme that converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Okay, so let's, I just wanted to make sure that you know where these juxtaglomerular cells are uh, in relation to the glomerulus and the distal tubule. So renin, the secretion of renin is controlled in three ways. Baroreceptors in those juxtaglomerular cells, those cells that I just showed you in the previous diagram, release renin in response to very low blood pressure. Also, sympathetic neurons in the cardiovascular control center of the medulla oblongata trigger renin secretion again in response to very low blood pressure. And then finally, those macula densa cells in the distal tubule respond to decreases in flow by releasing a paracrine signal that induces juxtaglomerular cells to release renin. So three different ways, all in response to very low blood pressure. Uh, as you'll see, it makes sense that it also triggers aldosterone release because that promotes salt reabsorption, sodium and chloride reabsorption, and water reabsorption to try to help bring blood pressure back up to normal levels. And these are the steps that are involved in the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone pathway. I'm going to read these to you right now, but then I'm going to switch over to the diagram and go through it one more time. So here are the steps. The juxtaglomerular cells secrete the enzyme renin. And renin is responsible for converting angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Then... Within the blood vessels, there's an enzyme called ACE. ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. Uh, again, these enzymes are within the epithelial of blood vessel 
and ACE is what converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 causes the synthesis and release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex, but also it's a powerful vasoconstrictor, hence the name angiotensin. So angiotensin 2, a powerful vasoconstrictor, increases total peripheral resistance and mean arterial pressure. Again, it's a mechanism to try to bring blood pressure back up to normal levels. So here's that diagram that I wanted to talk through one more time. Uh, in response to low blood pressure, those juxtaglomerular cells release renin. And renin is an enzyme that converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Now, angiotensinogen is a molecule that's produced by the liver. I just want to mention that as well. Uh, again, renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Now, within the blood vessels, there are those epithelial cells that um, are responsible for producing these angiotensin-converting enzymes, or ACE, angiotensin-converting enzymes. ACE actually is an enzyme that converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which is the active molecule. Angiotensin 2 does a couple of things. It's a powerful vasoconstrictor. It has effects on the cardiovascular system, increasing total peripheral resistance by increasing, it's basically again a powerful vasoconstrictor. Constrictor. Uh, when vasoconstriction occurs, again it increases total peripheral resistance and mean arterial pressure. But it also has effects on the kidney. It also promotes the release, the secretion of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex region. Aldosterone uh, travels to the cortical collecting duct where it promotes sodium and chloride and water reabsorption, also potassium secretion. But it's that salt and water reabsorption that helps bring blood pressure back up to normal levels. Uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention here you might have heard of the drug called uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. They're also called ACE inhibitors. It's a drug that's given to patients that have high blood pressure, right? And it's actually very effective in reducing vasoconstriction, total peripheral resistance, and ultimately reducing mean arterial pressure. Uh, but also it does double duty. It inhibits aldosterone, which then doesn't allow for salt and water retention. Uh, both of these uh, pathways are inhibited by ACE inhibitors to help lower blood pressure when patients have chronic high blood pressure. All right, so if you need a little bit more text, maybe looking at this pathway in a different way, Again, renin is released from those juxtaglomerular cells. It's an enzyme that converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. ACE within the blood vessels, these are the angiotensin converting enzymes, convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 does a multitude of things. It promotes the secretion of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex region. It also promotes vasoconstriction in the systemic arterioles. Uh, it does have effects on promoting the thirst behavior because it does stimulate vasopressin secretion as well. All of these things all together help to increase extracellular fluid volume and ultimately mean arterial pressure. And I just wanted to remind you as well that these juxtaglomerular cells are very closely associated with the afferent arterioles uh, close to the glomerulus. And both the sympathetic nerve fibers and the macula densa cells uh, control renin release of these juxtaglomerular cells. All right. 
So this sums up a lot of what we just talked about. Uh, in response to very low blood pressure, which can be caused by decreases in plasma volume, you can see that there's going to be an increase in the activity of renal sympathetic nerves, right? If you remember back to the cardiovascular section, in response to low blood pressure, you get an increase in heart rate, an increase in stroke volume, an increase in total peripheral resistance, with, which all try to help keep uh, bring mean arterial pressure back up to normal. So you get this increase in the activity of renal sympathetic uh, neurons. Uh, you also get a decrease in arterial pressure which leads to renal juxtaglomerular cells. They have these baroreceptors that increase renin secretion. And you also, with a decrease in plasma volume, get a decrease in glomerular filtration rate, which causes a decrease in flow to the macula densa cells. Also, there's that paracrine response that uh, decreases sodium and chloride delivery to the macula densa cells and ultimately uh, has effects on renin secretion as well. So multiple ways of triggering those juxtaglomerular cells to secrete renin. Uh, once renin is secreted, it actually increases plasma renin uh, levels. Then you get um, an increase in angiotensin, plasma angiotensin II levels, which promotes aldosterone secretion from the adrenal cortex region that increases circulating plasma aldosterone levels, which travel to the cortical collecting duct, duct which increase sodium and water reabsorption and ultimately decrease sodium and water excretion. All of these mechanisms help to bring back uh, normal levels of plasma volume and mean arterial pressure. All right, the last extrinsic mechanism that I want to go through is atrial natriuretic peptide. So remember, this is the last of the four. The four that we've talked about already are vasopressin, aldosterone, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone pathway, and then finally, atrial natriuretic peptide. Now, if you remember, I talked about this earlier, atrial natriuretic peptide is the only diuretic of the four. Um, atrial natriuretic peptide increases the release of sodium in the urine. I'll say this another way. It actually promotes sodium excretion. Uh, this molecule, atrial natriuretic peptide, is produced in specialized cells within the atria. Remember, the atria are two of the four chambers that are within the heart. The heart has four chambers, two atria, and two ventricles. And again, atrial natriuretic peptide is released by the atria. Uh, it's excreted in response to stretch associated with venous return with an increase in blood volume returning to the heart. And once atrial natriuretic peptide is released into the circulatory system, it travels to the kidney where it increases glomerular filtration rate by causing relaxation of those mesangeal cells, the contractile cells that control the size of the filtration slits of the glomerulus. Uh, but most importantly, atrial natriuretic peptide acts as a diuretic, and it does so by decreasing levels of aldosterone, renin, and vasopressin. It actually inhibits their release and acts as an antagonist with the renin, angiotensin II, and aldosterone pathway. So again, it acts as a profound diuretic. I always like to tell the story, uh, give you a visual or something to remember, to help you remember atrial natriuretic peptide. Um, I experience this all the time as a diver. Uh, when I go down to depth, I've taken a lot of time putting on that wetsuit, and once I get to depth, I'm in a horizontal position, and usually what happens is you get an increase in uh, venous return to the heart, a stretch of the atria, and then production and release of atrial natriuretic peptide, which ultimately makes you want to pee as soon as you get down to the depth of choice. 
Um, there are only two types of divers in this world, uh, those that pee in their wetsuit and those that lie about it. So uh, again, atrial natriuretic peptide is a very profound diuretic, and this is a story just to help you remember what atrial natriuretic peptide does. All right, so here's a flow chart to actually uh, review what we just talked about with atrial natriuretic peptide. Again, if there is an increase in plasma volume, uh, an increase in venous return, what that does is it stretches the atria. You get an increase in distension or stretch, which then increases atrial natriuretic peptide secretion. What happens then is ultimately you get an increase in plasma atrial natriuretic peptide levels, which decreases plasma aldosterone levels, but also has effects on the kidneys. It uh, has effects on arterioles. You get a afferent arteriolar dilation and efferent constriction, which increases glomerular filtration rate. And it also has effects on the um, tubules, the, uh, the collecting duct, where it decreases sodium reabsorption. Both of these factors together increase sodium excretion. All right, so these last slides, there's five of them, are flow charts that I would like you to go through on your own. There are different case studies or scenarios that help you solidify all that you know about um, intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms, how the heart is actually very closely tied to kidney function as well. So I'd like you to go through these last few slides on your own and try to do some synthesis, put a lot of these concepts together in an integrative fashion. Uh, we will be talking about this on Monday too, so just review them and like I said, if you have any questions, we can talk about it on Monday. That's it for this lecture, and um, please proceed to the quiz. Take the quiz before Monday's class at 8.30.